Morning with uh, our guest, who's retired Deputy Chief Justice Dijang Moseneke. And uh, he's been talking to us this morning about uh, his uh, memoir entitled My Own Liberator, but also just talking about his life in general. And it's so lovely that we've uh, got the privilege and opportunity to do so this morning. Thanks for staying on. Uh, I think this is unprecedented that we've asked someone to stay on for three different segments. So, I mean, it's, it's really lovely of you to, to oblige. Thank good, you again. Good to be here. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's lovely. Um, I want to to, we, you know, we know we know so much about your your career. As soon as you move sure. into law, and uh, you bash down boundaries that were never allowed. I mean, you weren't allowed to go into the areas you went into. You were not meant to. I mean, as a as basically a a, a, a convicted terrorist almost, going in and practicing law during the apartheid time and getting into the bar and doing everything you did. I mean, how, how did you manage to do that? I mean, you talk about breaking down barriers, but there's surely a limit to breaking barriers. Well, Liam. We should all cultivate a hatred for, for unreasonable um, inhibitions, exclusions, and all of those things that really keep us away. We ought to assume the role of being own liberators and getting out there and trying to change the world, sometimes alone, sometimes collectively. But, I mean, if the, those arrangements had succeeded, I would never have been the Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa. Yeah because I had to fight to become an attorney, kick the door to become an advocate, and to practice and defend activists during the 70s and 80s and in, in very difficult and trying circumstances. Mm. And you know that the, you know, the security system tried to kill me at least thrice, yeah. and I write about it in the book. Uh, and I didn't know it until the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when they wanted amnesty. So, but once you're confronted with challenges, I want to suggest, and that's why I lay out the detail in the book, young people have to understand that it's the moment that we have to try and reach and, and achieve our ideals. Yeah. I want to look at now, and I think it's a good, it's a good time to talk about what's happening at the universities. You, you of course, are the chancellor of its university. Uh, these protests are ongoing. They're getting violent. They're, many are describing them as getting out of control to a certain extent. Uh, um, a lot of students have been arrested for inciting violence and disrupting, uh, you know, the studies and whatever. But... I, I want to know your views on this. You've been quoted as saying that the protests are legitimate and they are very similar to the 1976 uprising. Seeing them evolving like this, you know, what, what can we do? Do you still believe that they're legitimate? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> there are two parts to the question, and let's deal with each of the parts. The first part is this. Um, universal access to further education um, is something that we ought to achieve. We ought to achieve it because it's necessary. Um, if we're serious about reducing the social distance, if we're serious about destroying inequality, after all, inequality is also about access to skills, to education, to ability to be able to enter the economy and, and, and be able to uh, deliver those goods that we need to be able to live full lives. So... There is no debate about that. But let's go back to our constitution. Our constitution in section 29 does two important things. It guarantees basic education without qualification. And it goes on to talk about further education, access to further education, subject to reasonable, subject to a progressive realization and availability of resources. So the simple point is, is that the state has an obligation increasingly, progressively, it must realize access to education. Mm. And that must surely be, it's commonsensical, particularly in a country where skills have been kept away by, structurally, by an apartheid and colonial system that kept, so the claim for access to education progressively is a valid one. So one can't, you cannot really contest that. And the state must arrange its affairs in such a way that there's progressive and increasingly it must be possible. So that implies we also have to rearrange our resources in a way that ensures that our young people have a fair shake in being able to access um, 
things that will make them human, mm. skills that will allow them to help grow this economy and change this kind. So that claim is valid. Yeah. And the morning when I was going to um, preside over the General Assembly at this, we as a university had agreed with students that their claim was valid. We don't agree with the militarization of, of the campuses and the universities because universities are open spaces in which there must be free contestation of ideas. But at the same time, within the university, there should be no violence whatsoever. No student could ever be entitled to initiate and instigate violence in a space that is obviously very vulnerable. Universities are vulnerable because they're meant to be open spaces. Yes, yeah. and, and they're meant to be free and, and no coercion, no violence ought to be tolerated. Mm. So as a university, the conflict will always continue. We don't want a militarized university, but we cannot stand by and look at such rare assets being destroyed or threatened with destruction. Remember that we are a university of about 36,000 students. Now, those who are not in protest are entitled to complete the academic year if they so choose. So we have a duty to make sure that they do complete. And that explains why we've been negotiating with those that are in uprising so that we can have a stable university. So just to wrap up, two parts to it. The one is the claim is legitimate and state must move to have a plan that will ensure that freeze don't rise all the time, but that in access is progressively possible so that we can help change the economy. So, th so that is the point. But as to violence, students must stop any intimidation and acts of violence because universities were never meant for that. Protests are permissible under the Constitution, violence not. We're going to wrap this conversation up after this break. Mm. Thank you for staying with us again and uh, don't go anywhere. We're just going to wrap up after we take this ad break. Mm.